listening to the API The Docs podcast. We are here to talk about API documentation upstream and downstream. It's a bit hit and miss how many developer relations teams actually have formal tech writers. A lot of advocates write a lot of their own content. They write blog posts, they write tutorials. There might be a copy editor, but in developer relations, there isn't always a strong tradition for having tech writers within the team. And it's a tricky thing because developers are so, it's such a subculture in lots of ways. Fundamentally, if you don't have written resources for your developers for a self-service developer-facing product or products, the rest is just decoration. The foundation isn't there if we don't have that reference or those resources. Ivan didn't have either technical writers or developer relations until quite recently. And so everything it has has been owned by everyone and contributed by everyone. Does it work? Does it work? Yes. I mean, it's going to work even better when those contributions go through some sort of copywriter language improvement developer education mindset filter. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) Because currently there is accurate information written down by the person who understood it. Hello and welcome to the API The Docs podcast. Your host today are myself, Annette Pojet, and my colleague Laura Vos. In our daytime jobs, we research and build developer portals at Pronovix. Hi, Laura. Hi, Annette. Our guest today is Lorna J. Mitchell. Hi, Lorna. Hello. A short introduction for those of you who have not yet met Lorna. Uh, she runs developer relations at Ivan, and otherwise, you're known. Why then everywhere as an open source software developer and project maintainer, a published author, a blogger, and a conference speaker. Mm -hmm. I asked you to be our guest here today so that we would talk about DevRel teams, like what is even developer relations, who's who, uh, what roles are playing out in a team, what do we call those, and what skills are essential. Mm -hmm. If I remember, I'm not sure, maybe this was in the Avocado book, but I'm not sure. Um, somebody defined developer relations as pursuing the unknown one interaction at a time. (laughs) That's a really good explanation. And in truth, developer relations is many things to many individuals and to many organizations. I normally try to say it as I explain my employer's product or like developer offering to developers. And then I explain developers to my employer. Um, So it's a very two-way process. And within the teams, you will find it's really varied, but typically you'll find advocates who, developer advocates who will be, um, might be writing tutorial content, creating video content, giving the conference talks. Sometimes you get specialist evangelists who really just give the talks and that's their focus, but uh, fewer and fewer of those. I think now mm-hmm. um, most of the advocates are wearing a lot of different hats. Let's start from a little bit from the context. Could you sketch that, which context you are in now? And because you have a tremendous experience and, you know, a lot of in and outs about open API spec as well. Uh, but you now recently joined Ivan, so it's a new situation. And I understand you're creating a developer portal, but not for an API. No. And that's been quite interesting because a lot of the best developer portal resources are, of course, around the APIs. I think because the APIs are the original developer facing experience. And so that they're the thing that most needed really developer centric documentation, distinct from the more traditional product documentation. I'm now with Ivan. We do open source data tools in the cloud. So any cloud any database, if you need Kafka, PostgreSQL, bunch of the time series databases, with Cassandra, with Redis, go check out the list with a free trial. Um, so it's lots of different products. They're all open source products. So they're the products that you know and love and maybe already use um, as a service in case you don't want to look after them around the clock yourself. We can do that. Um, so creating the portal or the resources for the developers, which by the way, isn't live yet, Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's very much a new initiative. I founded the developer relations team at Ivan six months ago, um, at the beginning of the year. And what we're looking at there is the kinds of things that developers ask us often, the kinds of things also that are different 
about how you perform a particular task on our platform. So even if you know how to do something with Postgres, when it's as a service, you're not root. And so there's some extra add-ons or some slightly different ways of doing things on our platform. Also, we have our own API. So there's examples using that, our own command line tooling, Terraform, some Kubernetes stuff coming up too. So there's lots of different ways for developers to use the tools that they kind of know. And it means that I just build quite patchy documentation to fill in those gaps and really just enable people to get where they want to go. Okay, so I have two yarn balls that I would like to unroll with you. One would be, how do you even prioritize these different jobs to be done? How do you build out the team? And then the other yarn ball is, how would this be different from an API portal? Do you need a different perspective? And so there's a lot of open source documentation already. Okay, um, let's start with the team and the structure and the priorities, mm -hmm. um, because I think the one leads into the other and your yarn balls mm -hmm. are perfectly well ordered. Um, so I am actually joint first uh, with DevRel, where there were two of us hired at the start of the year. And the team as it grows, the team should be eight or 10 people by the end of this year. Uh, there's currently four of us. We have a DevOps specialist and also our first tech writer. It's a bit hit and miss how many developer relations teams actually have formal tech writers. A lot of advocates write a lot of their own content. They write blog posts, they write tutorials. There might be a copy editor, but in developer relations, there isn't always a strong tradition for having tech writers within the team. And it's a tricky thing because developers are so, it's such a subculture in lots of ways that it's one of the few things that technical writing skills are not immediately transferable to. There's a lot, that audience has a lot of context um, that is quite hard to pick up, but without it, they can't understand you. So um, it's really interesting to me to take even really experienced technical writers on quite technical topics and see them coming over to address that very technical audience and understand a bit about their context. If you're a complete outsider, developers are super weird. So um, that's been really interesting. And I'm also interested to hear from others um, who have made that same transition. And I think a lot of tech writers, some are wonderfully well-trained, but many just fell into it and sort of discovered their talent when they were trying to do something else completely. And uh, how you acclimatize I think is something that I personally am missing. You know, I've been a developer for mumble, mumble years. And um, it's hard to imagine what was strange at the beginning, like how a normal person would see this. Well, now you're going to onboard some colleagues, so that might pull back some memories. We had a conversation uh, with Anit and Barry from Google, who is our lead tech writer there. And we came to this thing that as a technical writer, like it's essential to have curiosity and empathy driving you. When you say, okay, I'm coming from the dev side of this, what would those things be? I think for the developer side, it still has to be those things for everything we do in developer relations. If we understand our audience and we lead with empathy, we understand where they're coming from. You know, a lot of my blog content will be inspired by things I've seen on Stack Overflow, problems that I'm aware that have come past in support because we do also help out on support. Then it coming from that place, even though I'm not a specialist writer, then we kind of get there. And because I've been working in written content for a long time as a technical author, as a writer for a bunch of different outlets, and I am very curious about what the editors do after they get my content, you know, I've learned some stuff. And I think that's one thing that the technical writers really bring is that ability to make sure that what we have is fun, but not too fun, friendly, but not too friendly, and technical, but not impenetrable. Seeing like log output when they're testing things and being like, who is this even for? What None of these are words. Um, really, it's great because it makes you kind of think about what you have and, and how you address the, that information to people. Can you tell how you see now the growing circles of documentation and workflows and how do you have to grow the team to be able to maintain it and to create it? 
Okay, so let me think about that. With the with the circles of documentation, currently we are publishing mostly to the blog, and that's always going to be important. People come there; it's linked off the main website, and there's yeah, timely content goes there. As I say, we're building a new developer portal, and the tooling for that is something that I thought quite hard about because I don't have writers that gatekeep. And they are the only people allowed to contribute. You know, Ivan didn't have either technical writers or developer relations until quite recently. And so everything it has has been owned by everyone, contributed by everyone. Does it work? Does it work? Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to work even better when those contributions go through some sort of copywriter language improvement developer education mindset filter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> Because currently there is accurate information written down by the person who understood it. And I am taking that very accurate and thoughtful information and re-architecting it in a way you might find it, that it's task-based, that the steps are in the order you would want to do them, not the order we thought about them, and those kinds of things. So I'm hoping that the two things together, the domain knowledge and the clear process is really helpful. In terms of tooling, we've gone with Sphinx because Ivan is a company full of Python developers who already all write restructured text. So if you look at the internal private documentation repos on how to run the platform, also well-structured restructured text content. So that was a no-brainer for us. I think the tech writers, had, anyone who's happy to work in docs as code can handle the different markup formats and that's not, you know, even though restructured text isn't the most common, I find it a really good balance between powerful enough, but not so complicated that it's super hard for someone else to get started. Have you experience with other markups? Yes. Um, I try not to write LaTeX. I have done in the past. I really like ASCII doc. I find Markdown just a bit depressing because it's a little bit inconsistent and quite simple. It's also hard to pass programmatically if you need to. Um, so restructured text for me is like just enough mm -hmm. without being unapproachable because my goal is not necessarily to make this beautiful masterpiece of technical writing. It's to be a facilitator. The docs platform will be open source. So if people need to add things, fix things, If the engineers are able to contribute, the support engineers particularly, they are very good at this, then I'm there to facilitate the process, provide the reviews, fill in the gaps, respond to requests for things, you know, and really pull those efforts together. There's a lot happening already. Um, and starting DevRel at Ivan has been more like finding the different threads and knitting them together. Do you see any pitfalls of using restructured text right now or... What can occur in the future? Um, it's not the most widely supported in tools. There's that. But I mean, GitHub previews it just the same way. And running Sphinx locally hasn't been hard. I mean, it's Python, so it's cross-platform. Everyone's been able to contribute. But it hasn't been a big problem for us yet. The project is also not live yet. So maybe we should do like a, <laughs> a, a one year. <laughs> Things I wish I'd done differently. <laughs> So what are the priorities for the jobs to be done for this dev world? And where did you put that line in the sand where you say, okay, this is enough to go live and then iterate from there? So we haven't made the go live call yet, but the way that we approach this project is it's been on the wish list. It's been like a goal for some department somewhere in the company for about a year. And, you know, we're a very fast scaling company. We've had another injection of funding this year. The growth is something that I actually can't quite get my head around. And I haven't met anyone yet, right? We're all still pandemic remote. The headquarters are in Helsinki and I haven't been there yet. So the way that I approached this was we did a one quarter sort of time boxed effort to create something that looked like the portal, was had the tooling and the structure set up for the portal, which had two products worth of documentation migrated from the old site. And that has been quite a repurposing and restructuring. We've added some fresh material as well that we saw gaps. It's the end of the quarter. So I'm now delivering that with two products in it. And that by bringing that scope right down, it's given us a more manageable project to work on. And then I've also found that One thing we did was we really invested in great search technology. So we've got search that will find things on the existing. We have like a knowledge base that I'm moving content off. 
Mm -hmm. um, so we'll have redirects set up as things move and we'll have a search box that will find it regardless of where we left it. And the main goal there is to avoid disrupting people while this work is going on. You know, we can't wait until everything's perfect and keep do all the work in two places for a year. So this is the transition plan to make sure that there is a way to find things, even though I'm moving stuff around while other people are trying to get work done, including, of course, our customers and also our colleagues. Is there something you had to let go? I would have loved to have had more code samples, I think, at this point, because it's something that, we, but it's something that we didn't already have. And so it didn't come over in the migration because it didn't exist. I didn't feel I really needed to cancel things, but it did mean that we didn't, there were lots of other things that could have been top priorities for developer relations. But fundamentally, if you don't have written resources for your developers for a self-service developer facing product or products the rest is just decoration the foundation isn't there if we don't have that reference or those resources and so that's why I prioritized it and it was I feel possibly over ambitious um, but we're hiring I'm really looking for people who are going to either make the transition in either direction so you already know a bit about some of this technology and you love to write about it and you write and edit well enough Or you're a tech writer who's really curious about the technology and interested in the databases and you want to come the other way because although developer relations teams and tech writers or documentation teams are often separate, I love that they're together and that we're creating not just the documentation content, but also the longer tutorials, the blog posts, mm -hmm. probably posts for other platforms and all of those high quality education content pieces that we're doing all of that together. Have you ever mentored someone into such? Yes, although I've mostly only mentored people coming like me from the technical side and, and learning to express themselves and present information as an educator. So now I'm kind of going the other way. And I find that much harder because, of course, I don't have that context of what's weird about working in such a technical company <laughs> um, and being able to people who you know don't have their own tool set up or can't set things up themselves that's been more of a challenge so the onboarding process for those employees is ha huh, there's room for improvement and that's something that as a brand new manager I definitely need to improve at from your experience from what point it is absolutely necessary to have technical writers in a tech company If I had my own way, I would hire tech writers before you got to 10 people. I think having a technical writer in the company is an asset, whether you're writing, I don't know, a press release or, you know, written media work, the user experience, if you have um, any kind of user interface, you know, I feel that that awareness of conscious communication if you can get them to look at your error messages we've, we're just doing a little revisit on some of ours now we have tech writer resource and they are so horrified <laughs> but that's great that it's like here is a thing that we can very easily make better it doesn't need to be like employee number one <laughs> but if you get to 20 and you don't have one I think you're doing it wrong and I think it is not only about the, the number of employees what but workflows So it is often hard to smoothly put a tech writer in a company after, I don't know, 20 people. I think it is difficult. And often we hire a tech writer because we are going to ask them to work alone to document the product features. Or we're going to hire a copywriter and we will ask them to write marketing content for the blog. Whereas just having them in the mix and available to help with things, it's a real asset. And I hope that other, particularly developer relations teams, will follow some of what we've done here and also focus on the written content. And I think there's an, a growing understanding that developer relations is evolving from preaching the word mm -hmm. <laughs> on conference stages, you know, like very glamorous. Uh, spoiler, it's not glamorous. It's a warm <laughs> salad in your hotel room at 9 p.m. But there's a better understanding that what we should be doing here is oiling where the internal and external people meet and kind of making that connection 
as smooth as it can be. And that means all aspects of developer experience. So we might be giving product feedback. We might be creating developer tools or skeleton applications that people can use. The documentation is an obvious piece of developer experience that we can invest in as teams or collaborate with teams if that's already established. So I think that's I think that's growing. It's spreading out of the sort of API fintech space and starting mm-hmm. to come across to other less obvious platforms. Well, like you said, the pandemic has changed this a lot because it was long enough to to force new habits, but also the DevRa community as such uh, so so expressively embraced uh, mental health. I think that also changed things a lot. We've burned out too many talented people in developer relations who've come, done a DevRel role, been absolutely punished by it, and they'll never work in DevRel again. We have to stop that. We have to find a sustainable way to make this career work for people, to give them career paths for growth as well. And wherever you come from, you know, if you come in through the writing route, there still needs to be more than just most senior writer in the building. You need to be able to grow your skills and look at what's next. And I think, you know, there are movements now, groups like Fly Less, where we're looking at how we can be more intentional about traveling for something where we, it really helps to all be in one room. But when I give a conference talk on a stage, it's one way can do that here. Real time is cool. I have so enjoyed the pre-recorded talks and like all the text chat and literally getting stream of consciousness from the room. (laughs) Um, I've never felt so connected or learned so much from my audiences as I have in this setup. And I hope that it's not going to be the case that you can only ever choose one reality or the other. I hope that we keep the best of both worlds. So a lot of technical writers found themselves in a situation that they need to create docs from scratch but what's the case when there are already docs and there is an open source project do you have a different approach for this or can you encapsulate it (laughs) yeah let me try and think about that so we have some knowledge base articles and they kind of try to fill the gaps around the documentation that covering the things that are specific to our platform. So for example, our Kafka setup uses usually mutual TLS, which you need two certificates for. It's not the default way to run Kafka. So most of the readmes for all the different tools don't outline this like extra certificate step. Mm -hmm. So we have docs for how to connect to Kafka Cat, how to connect to Kafdrop, all the different tools, because it's a little bit special. And you could reuse that information if you were using the same setup as us, people link to it and that's fine. So those are the sorts of things that we are trying to add. And also because the offerings on our platform are things like Elasticsearch, Soon OpenSearch, uh, Postgres, M3DB, they're all open source projects. So if there's a gap in their documentation, that's on us to fix it. You know, we're part of the ecosystem. We blog about their platforms and that helps all the users of those projects, but also they're open source projects, you know, we're standing on each other's shoulders to become giants. So um, I am indirectly the advocate (laughs) for all of those things. And so you become participant in those projects and we would link out to their documentation because that's the whole point, you know, that we, we bring things together. Ivan is just launching an open source program office where we have also developers who commit to the upstream projects or the adjacent projects or you know, other open source activities. And I see that part of our documentation and community work as being very much aligned with that initiative at Ivan. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully Ivan is visible enough that it will serve as an example and then others follow. Well, if you want your open source project that you are building some kind of service on to live and thrive, then you need to be part of the project and not just a consumer. And that's something that we've known for a while And to see the open source program office formally becoming a thing is pretty magical. Sounds good. Are there any skills you have been picking up recently, maybe connected to this project or something you are digging yourself into right now? Let's say technologies, methods. Everything. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I haven't run a DevRel department before. I haven't started any sort of department from scratch before. And I'm a new manager. So um, my calendar is my calendar is full and my reading list is long. 
Um, but it is super interesting. And I, I love the selection of products that we have. And even when I'm just, you know, reviewing something, going through the tech steps, trying things out, I'm learning something new. Even when, yeah, the Write the Docs uh, Slack channel has been a source of excellent support, particularly around the tooling setup. We're using Sphinx. There's some really good Sphinx users and, and like the plugin authors and things there. So I've learned quite a lot about that and about uh, Veil, Docs as Code, the different integration tooling. I was aware of it before, but actually deploying it was interesting and rewarding. And I love what we have. So yeah, I feel like I've learned loads in the last few months. That's a super hard question to answer. So let's rephrase it. Do you have like a pet peeve of yours? You find yourself um, talking with other people when you get a chance? Right now, my pet peeve is the state of the manager's calendar. <laughs> I cannot get anything done. How do you live like this? <laughs> um, and everyone just kind of smiles and nods sympathetically. Oh, you're a new manager. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but like what happens? Anyway, it turns out what you do is you block your calendar so you can get real work done. So that, that was last week's discovery. And I uh, hope to build on that. <laughs> is there some old domain knowledge that is now coming back to say hello? Like for me, that's chemistry and and you know thermodynamics it always comes back to say hello anything do you have that yeah to some extent um i haven't really been formally an educator although i've been in devrel for about five years and now we're like really trying to think about from scratch the curriculum the space that we want to cover you know what isn't here that should be because when I was a consultant and a trainer, I did this kind of stuff all the time. And there were lots of kind of topic mapping and that sort of thing. And I haven't done it for a while, um, but now I'm really starting to ramp back up on that and look at what we can create and, and how that engagement is working, how we can best serve our communities, because that's what developer relations is really about. What are the conclusions that you want to leave the listeners with? I would like everyone to understand that developer relations is moving more to meet some of the things we've known in technical writing for a long time and that I think those reusable resources are absolutely growing and that developer relations is totally a career that is open for technical writers who understand and enjoy helping developers. It is all about the empathy but I'd also like to Shout out to all of the, you know, job title technical writers who are actually creating educational curriculum, doing screencasts, videos, internal resources, lunch and learns. Like, I want you to know that you are pretty much developer advocates now. And there's a whole world here that would welcome you. I'm so enjoying that crossover of having writers in my team um, and seeing how they challenge and um, contribute to what we already have, particularly in such a technical company where we can be a little bit groupthink. I think this is magical and I hope that this is a topic that we visit again and again as the industry evolves. You know, you've been doing dev portals for a long time. We've had a lot of these communities, discussions and conversations in the API space, but seeing it move out more generally and seeing the explosion in investment in developer relations, like the message I want to leave is that tech writers are definitely part of the story. And I hope that you know that we need you. Thank you, Lorna. And thank you for being here. Thanks thank for you. having me. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. Thanks again to our guest, to Pronovix for letting us work on this, and the entire API The Docs community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website apidocs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API The Docs conferences as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well.